Well, first of all, before we begin here, I want to thank Betty Sador and El Camino College Community Education for presenting this series. I also want to thank our guest this evening, Gary Metzger, and you'll hear from Gary. You. What, the way we'll handle this is that I'm going to, uh, the presentation I have is for about 30 minutes, and then I'm going to turn to Gary here and engage in a conversation with him about uh, the evolution of journalism mass communication since this launch and during the past 10 years, and then we want to engage you in questions and observations that you have about the, the subject and, and why we have things. Sound good? Yes. Beautiful. And is sound coming through back there okay for you? Beautiful. Okay. We are exploring the launch of Facebook, something that I, for most of you, is probably deep in your lives right now. And what we're going to be looking at specifically is that first year and how it came into existence and the evolution of communication since that time. And the source for the material that we have here is by David Kirkpatrick, a, a noted business author. Um, who I might add, also, um, there was an article in the LA Times uh, this past week in the business section about a major uh, social networking conference that was held in Spain, and uh, Zuckerberg was interviewed on stage, and it was by uh, David Kirkpatrick at that time. It's a wonderful book, uh, The Facebook Effect, and you can, if what you hear tonight is of interest to you, I would encourage you to pick it up. It's at many of the local libraries. And then, of course, we take advantage of Facebook here as well, and you can like us over at our own little page there. The concept of social networking is not new, and many of the components of early Facebook were originally pioneered. And how is my son? Am I coming through loud enough for most of you back here? Okay, beautiful. Were originally pioneered by others. Zuckerberg has been, and that's Mark Zuckerberg, I will add, has been accused several times of stealing ideas to create Facebook. But in fact, his service is the heir to ideas that have been evolving for 40 years. In 1968, J.C.R. Licklider and Robert W. Taylor envisioned something that we know today as the Internet, in a key essay entitled, The Computer as Communication Device. And Licklider, an employee with the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Defense, helped conceive and fund what became known as ARPANET, which in time led to the Internet. In 1979, Usenet was developed to allow non-technical user, users to post messages to groups dedicated to specific topics. And I'm just wondering, are any of you familiar with some of these? You, as we get into this history, some of these things will stop popping up to you. 1982, the French Postal Service launched Minitel, a nationwide online service. And in 1985, the founders of the Whole Earth Catalog developed the Whole Earth Electronic Link, or WELL. And I just want to ask here, how many of you remember the Whole Earth Catalog? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. 1987, Howard Rheingold, a big user of Well, coined the term virtual community, a group of people who may or may not <coughs> meet one another face to face and who exchange words and ideas through the mediation of computer bulletin boards and networks. 1988, IBM and Sears Roebuck created the online service Prodigy. How many of you remember Prodigy? Beautiful. Good. Okay, we're getting into the <laughs> land is in sight. Didn't understand it, but 
1993, the World Wide Web was developed, leading to the creation of such sites as the Globe, GeoCities, Tripod, that enabled users to set up personal homepages that could link to other members. 1997, modern social networking began with Andrew Weinrich's New York-based startup called SixDegrees.com. This was the first service that attempted to identify and map a real set of relationships between real people using their real names. The service was hugely expensive to build, relied on, if you can believe this, dial-up speed, and could only add photos that had been, get this, mailed in and for posting to personal pages. 2001, Adrian Scott launched a social networking site, Rise, which was about work relationships, and it only took hold in the San Francisco Bay Area, however. 2003, Jonathan Abrams, a local programmer and RISE member, saw an opportunity to focus on the non-work part of people's lives and built a social network called Friendster. It was an immediate hit, and within months, had several million users. But just as Friendster started to hit the big time, the experience of its users began to spiral downward. Millions were joining, and Friendster's servers were slowing. In order to address the technical problems, Abrams resorted to a big infusion of cash from venture capitalists, and within a year, they removed him from the company. 2003, Reed Hoffman founded LinkedIn. 2003 also saw Tom Anderson found MySpace, which brings us now to the beginning of Facebook. When sophomore Mark Zuckerberg arrived in his dorm room at Harvard Kirkland House in September 2003. Right away that first week, Zuckerberg cobbled together internet software that he called Course match. The idea was to help students pick classes based on who else was taking them. Hundreds of students immediately began using this service. And emboldened by the unexpected success of Course Match, Zuckerberg decided to try out some other ideas. His next project in October 2003, he called Face Match. Its purpose figure out who was the hottest person on campus. <laughs> he invited users to compare two different images of the same sex and say which one was hotter. As your rating got hotter, your picture would be compared to hotter and hotter people. The entire program was completed in an eight hour stretch. The photos of the face mash website came from the so-called Facebooks maintained by each of the Harvard houses where undergraduates lived. They were pictures taken the day students arrived for orientation, so you know how flattering they were. <laughs> he started running the Face MASH website on his internet-connected laptop in the mid-afternoon of Sunday, November 2nd. He emailed links to a few friends to test it out. And once people started using it, they apparently couldn't stop. His testers alerted their own friends, and Face Mash became an instant underground hit. During the winter break, Zuckerberg got deep into coding yet another project, however. On January 11, 2004, Zuckerberg went online and registered the web address thefacebook.com for one year. This site borrowed ideas from Course Mash and Face Mash, as well as from the service Friendster that Zuckerberg 
belong to. And here is his image on Friendster right there. Like most social networks at that time, Friendster was primarily interested, intended to help you connect with people for dating. Friendster had taken Harvard by storm the previous year, but had fallen from favor after technical strains. The other social network, MySpace, was growing quickly and already had about a million members. Students at Harvard had been urging the school to develop an online Facebook, but officials were reluctant owing to privacy issues. Zuckerberg figured he could get people to upload this information themselves. In fact, he later said that it was the school newspaper's editorials about face mash that gave him the initial idea how to build the Facebook. Simply ask students to volunteer their personal information. That insight combined with Zuckerberg, both course match and face mash had operated over Zuckerberg's dorm room net connection from his laptop. But Course Match's success had taken its toll on his hard drive, and Zuckerberg searched around for online, searched around online, and found a hosting company called Manage.com, where he entered his credit card number and started paying $85 a month for space on a computer service. That's where the Facebook's software and data would reside. In another sign that he thought something unusual might happen with um, Facebook, he made a deal with a classmate, Eduardo Sabrin, to give him one-third of the Facebook in exchange for Sabrin making a small initial investment and helping out with business matters. On the afternoon of Wednesday, February 24, 2004, Zuckerberg clicked a link on his account with Manage.com, and the Facebook.com went live. Its home screen read, the Facebook is an online directory that connects people through social networks at colleges. We have opened up the Facebook for popular consumption at Harvard University. You can use the Facebook to search for people at your school, find out who is in your classes, look up your friends' friends, see a visualization of your social network. The software spread quickly from the very beginning. The first users, Zuckerberg's Kirkland House neighbors, sent emails to other students asking them to join and become their friends. Thus began a viral explosion. By Sunday, four days after launch, more than 650 students had registered. The Facebook almost instantly became a main topic of conversation in Harvard dining halls and between classes. People couldn't stop using it. To sign up, you created a profile with a single picture of yourself along with a bit of personal information. Privacy controls were part of the original design, and there were restrictions. You couldn't join unless you had a harvard.edu email address, and you had to use your real name. That made the Facebook exclusive. It also ensured that users were who they said they were. Anybody remember AOL chat rooms? <laughs> Validating people's identity in this way made the Facebook fundamentally different from just about everything else that had come before it on the internet. By the end of the first week, about half of all Harvard's undergraduates had signed on, but students were not the only ones showing their faces online. The Facebook was available to Harvard alumni and staff. After three weeks, the Facebook had more than 6,000 users. Immediately, students at schools other than Harvard were emailing Zuckerberg asking when they could have it too. And Zuckerberg and his roommate, Dustin Moskowitz, started expanding to new schools quickly, even though both were taking a full course load. 
They open to students at Columbia on February 25th, to Stanford the next day, and to Yale on the 29th. Stanford is where the broad appeal of the Facebook was first proven. After just one week, the Stanford Daily was writing that the Facebook.com craze has swept through the campus. It reported that nearly 3,000 students had already signed up. Zuckerberg hated interviews and talking in public, but he gave Stanford Daily a lot of time. Quote, I know it sounds corny, but I'd love to improve people's lives, especially socially, he told the paper. Emails started to arrive from around the country begging Zuckerberg and crew to bring the, the Facebook to their schools. Within weeks, the Harvard sophomore had launched their services at MIT, at University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, Brown, and finally Boston University. By the end of March, with the active users numbering of surpassing 30,000, the Facebook was paying $450 per month for five servers at themanage.com, and Zuckerberg and Savrin each agreed to invest another $10,000 into the company. It was harder and harder to simply keep the Facebook operating smoothly. Thousands of users could be online at once, straining the servers, and Zuckerberg and Moskowitz tried to delay adding new schools until they had worked out the kinks of users they already have. The boys were using free open source software like MySQL database and Apache web server tools, which made the entire undertaking affordable. But while the software might have been free, it was not simple to operate. Zuckerberg was a more practiced programmer than Moskowitz, but he had never operated these kinds of programs before. He was learning by the day, even as he studied for four courses. But so popular was the Facebook that by the end of that semester, each time they added a new school, its students signed up almost en masse. In mid-April 2004, business manager Sabrin took steps to formalize the Facebook as a business. He set up a limited liability company in Florida where he had gone to high school, and the partners listed were Zuckerberg, Moskowitz, and Sabler. Though revenues for the Facebook were non-existent in its first few weeks, by mid February, Zuckerberg had already begun fielding calls from people interested in investing. They'd heard about the extraordinary growth of this new site and they wanted to get a piece of it. At the end of the semester, a classmate whose father was a well-known investor took Zuckerberg around New York to meet with venture capitalists and executives in the finance and media industries. At one of these meetings in June, a financier offered Zuckerberg $10 million for the company. Zuckerberg had just turned 20. The Facebook was four months old. He didn't for a month think seriously about accepting. As spring of 2004 semester wound down, things at the Facebook just got busier. And by the end of May, it was operating at 34 schools and had 100,000 users. In June 2004, business manager Sabrin opened a bank account and began depositing advertising revenues there. Maximizing revenue by selling ads was less important to Zuckerberg than keeping users happy. It wasn't unusual for contemporary web thinkers to be uninterested in advertising. Sites like Craigslist and Wikipedia were at the time rapidly becoming among the Internet's largest by taking a patently non-commercial approach. At this time, Zuckerberg searched the Craigslist itself 
and found a four-bedroom ranch house in Palo Alto, California, which he rented as a summer sublet. He decided he wanted to go out to California for several reasons. Most of all, it was the promised land of technology. <clears throat> Quote, Palo Alto was kind of this mythical place where all the tech used to come from, Zuckerberg told a reporter a few months later. So I was like, I want to check that out. <laughs> it was also at this time that Zuckerberg renewed his relationship with Sean Parker. Parker was one half of the team that built Napster, the file sharing service, <clears throat> excuse me, the file sharing service that upset the music industry. Parker had gone on to form another internet company, Plaxo. In March, Parker sent Zuckerberg an email out of the blue. He played up his Napster bona fides and offered to introduce Zuckerberg to savvy San Francisco investors who understood social networking. A dinner was arranged in New York. In early April, Parker flew himself out to New York for dinner. Zuckerberg was thrilled to meet with the founder of Napster, which he considered one of the most important things that had ever happened on the internet. And Parker was quickly impressed with Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg sketched out his vision for what the Facebook could become. It was an even bigger vision than Parker had expected. When Zuckerberg met Parker two months later now in Palo Alto, he had strongly, he had a strong and positive recollection of their New York dinner meeting. Parker was one of the people who seemed to really understand what the Facebook was about. In Palo Alto, Zuckerberg witnessed the denouement of Parker's months-long battle with his former backers at Plaxo. Zuckerberg and his friends were with Parker when he received a critical phone call from his lawyer. The news was bad. The Plaxo board had decided not to allow half of Parker's remaining Plaxo shares to vest. In other words, he was getting kicked out of his own company and losing his chance to make any money if it later went public or was sold. Parker was enraged. The Facebook boys listened in awe and dismay. Zuckerberg had little experience dealing with investors, though they had been approaching him regularly since March, hoping to get a piece of the Facebook. It was a formative moment and a critical one for the Facebook's future. Feeling as if his friend, feeling for his friend, and thinking he might learn much from Parker, Zuckerberg invited him to move into the house in Palo Alto with him. And by September, Zuckerberg was calling Parker the company's president. <clears throat> what Parker brought the Facebook was both a practical understanding of the realities of young engineers' work to bolster their site and to refine its features, Parker started thinking about what it would mean to turn the Facebook into a real company. He hired the lawyer who helped him set up Plaxo. He started looking for someone to manage operations, a fundamental task in internet, internet companies that involves making sure the data center and servers are operating properly. Up until then, all that work had been outsourced to third-party companies but the Facebook was getting too big for that. Parker discovered that his young colleagues didn't even know the basics about network management, like what a router was. He found an engineer who had experience at eBay who worked from home in San, San Jose. Parker became the Facebook's front man, especially with investors. A couple of Google executives came over to see if there might be a way to work with or even buy the Facebook. Even at this early date, Google was well aware that something was going, that something noteworthy was going on in Palo Alto. Zuckerberg and Parker were leery, however, because the risk of becoming subsumed by the Silicon Valley's internet giant was real. If they wanted to do something on their own, they had to stay independent, they believed. Besides, what they were doing was fundamentally different from what Google did. Their site was about people, Google was about data. 
It was becoming apparent that the Facebook was turning into a real business, and Zuckerberg had to take more deliberate steps to evolve both technologically and as a business. That summer, the growth had seen, seemed a bit scary. They didn't add any new schools until midsummer, but membership kept steadily climbing all summer at the 34 schools where the Facebook was already operating. The software and data that the Facebook were running on servers at a shared facility at Santa Clara, 12 miles south. The guys had to drive down there frequently to unbox, install, and wire up more servers. They began assuming that the Facebook was going to continue to keep growing, and every time the database was upgraded or the server array reconfigured, Zuckerberg tried to do it in a way that could accommodate 10 times more users than the Facebook had at the moment. This implicit optimism proved prescient. If Zuckerberg hadn't had that confidence as early as the summer of 2004, his company might easily have suffered embarrassing and possibly catastrophic outages. By this, but the specter of Friendster's failure to manage its own growth loomed large, and Zuckerberg was determined that would not happen to the Facebook. He became obsessed with how well the Facebook was working technically. He knew that communi for a communication service like this, performance was key. But there was an additional factor that helped the Facebook from performance disaster in its early days. Zuckerberg and his team were able to deliberately pace the Facebook's growth. They did it by deciding when to turn on new schools, and each time they added a campus, traffic surged. So if the systems were acting up, capacity was at the max, or they couldn't yet afford new servers, they'd simply wait before launching at the next school. This was a rare asset in an underfinanced web startup. It allowed the Facebook to grow methodically, even though it was being run by a bunch of inexperienced kids. <laughs> Another key factor in the Facebook's early success was its use of open source software. In fact, an up from the bottom <coughs> web business like this, without real backers, could not have emerged much before this. Open source operation software in 2004 had only recently achieved robustness and maturity. Without it, Zuckerberg would not have been able to create a fully featured website in his dorm room and pay for nothing other than the server to run it. Nonetheless, keeping it all running and buying new equipment as the Facebook grew was starting to cost real money. Zuckerberg spent about $20,000 in the first couple of weeks his crew was in Palo Alto, mostly to add servers at the hosting facility. And more spending was clearly necessary. The money came out of an account Sabrin had set up in Florida. In addition to the cash he and Zuckerberg had deposited, the account was augmented with a considerable amount of advertising income. But with school out, ad sales had pretty much stopped for the summer. Parker and the new lawyer were trying to straighten out the company's legal status. The limited liability corporation Saverin had set up was not a sufficient formal structure. It lacked governing documents to define what the company, what, how the company operated. There were no contracts, no official employees, and no payroll. Outside investment would soon be needed to get the Facebook, uh, would be needed, but to get it, the Facebook would have to be turned into a real company. However, Sandrin started to make that difficult. <clears throat> By mid-July, Parker was starting to talk to investors about putting money into the Facebook. But when Sandrin got wind of these discussions, he wrote a letter to Zuckerberg saying that the original agreement between the partners was that he would have control over business and he wanted a contract to guarantee him that control. Parker and the lawyer, meanwhile, were preparing to create an entirely new legal structure. 
they were filing papers to incorporate the Facebook in Delaware. Parker, managing the restructuring, was particularly concerned that the intellectual property that defined what the Facebook was, that is the company's most critical possession, was not owned by the company. The Facebook, excuse me, Sabrin, in setting up the LLC, had not sufficiently defined what it controlled. As the creator, most of the software and design was by right owned by Zuckerberg personally, along with some owned by his classmate, Moskowitz. Legally speaking, there was hardly a company before this point. Sabrin controlled the bank account, but the servers where the service actually resided, along with the intellectual property, were under the control of Zuckerberg, Moskowitz, and Parker. The Florida LLC was more or less an empty shell, and what it actually owned was unclear. Zuckerberg and Moskowitz signed over their portion of the LLC, plus the critical IP, to the new corporation. In later legal findings, Zuckerberg stated that he told Sabrin that because he refused to move to California with the rest of them and had not done the work that he said he would do, he was subsequently no longer an employee of the company. And while his ownership interest would remain, they would inevitably be subject to dilution. Sabrin later claimed that he did not know the company was being reincorporated or about several other aspects of this plan. But something he learned around this time must have made him a lot angrier because this is when he froze the Florida bank account, making it impossible for the company to pay its bills. As negotiations with Sabrin continued, Zuckerberg had to spend his own money to keep the lights on and the servers running. Zuckerberg and his family ended up spending $85,000 that summer. For 25 new servers alone, he spent $28,000. Zuckerberg and Moskowitz were planning to launch 70 more campuses in September. Parker was well along in continued discussions with investors who the guys hoped would give them the money they needed without too many strings. Some weeks earlier, Zuckerberg and Moskowitz took about five minutes to decide they wouldn't return to Harvard. Earlier, they thought that they'd be able to run the Facebook from their dorm room again, but signs were that this could be an explosive year for the service. They didn't want to mess it up. As the fall semester of 2004 loomed, the Facebook was on the verge of a serious crisis. Over the summer, membership had almost doubled now to 200,000 users. But, with the, but this crisis wasn't just a technological one. Tensions were also growing among the company's small team about whether the Facebook itself ought to be their only priority. Zuckerberg was getting increasingly interested in Wirehog, his parallel project to enable the Facebook users to share photos and other media peer to peer. In addition, Sabrin was still sitting on the bank account and Zuckerberg was paying bills out of his own pocket. The boys of the Facebook knew that they didn't have enough servers when the school opened, the service might just grind to a halt. The Facebook, as mentioned, was an atypical startup in financial terms. It hadn't required outside funding up to this point, but now with growth likely and costs rising, a new Silicon Valley company would typically solicit venture capitalists to make a large capital infusion, several million dollars for a company of the Facebook size. But in such a scenario, VCs take their pound of flesh, a very big chunk of the company, perhaps a quarter or even a third. Parker had gone through that at Plaxo, where he lost the battle of wills with the VCs and been kicked out of his own company. He had su successfully infected Zuckerberg with his aversion to VCs. The two were resolute about retaining full control of the company's destiny. After all, they just wanted a few hundred thousand dollars to buy more servers. Owing to 
Sean Parker's business friendships with former PayPal principal Peter Thiel, Zuckerberg was able to secure the right kind of funding, and for it, Thiel may go down in history as one of the great investments of all time. He agreed to loan the Facebook $500,000, which was intended to eventually convert to a 10.2 ownership in the company, that million dollars. This valuation was lower than had been dangled in front of Zuckerberg earlier, but he was pleased to have found an investor who seemed to believe in giving the entrepreneur the benefit of the doubt. In September, the Facebook's full-time California staff was just Zuckerberg, Moskowitz, and Parker, and the operations manager. They had moved out of the summer sublet and found a new rental in the Los Altos Hills a few miles south. At this time, the Facebook added two features that gave the students even more reason to spend time there. Now included on the user's profile was something called the wall, which allowed anyone to write whatever they wanted on your profile. It could also message you or comment about you, the equivalent of a public email. The other new addition was groups. Now any user could create a group on the Facebook for any reason. Each group had its own page, much like a profile, which included its own wall-like comment board. With its new structure and rapidly growing membership, the Facebook seemed to be growing up. Demand was even more ferocious than they expected. In September alone, they nearly doubled membership again to around 400,000, but that was quickly becoming clear that even Thiel's money wasn't enough to cover all the costs of a rapidly growing company's infrastructure. Adding new servers was almost a daily activity. Parker got in touch with a firm, Western Technology Investment, which he knew from his Plaxo days, and the company negotiated a $300,000 three-year line of credit. This company's governance structure following Thiel's investment had some unusual provisions. The board of directors included four seats. One was held by the investor Thiel, one by Parker, and one by Zuckerberg. The fourth seat was Zuckerberg's to allocate as he saw fit and remain for the time being vacant. The deal was to outnumber outsiders and to make it impossible for any future investor to usurp the company. This is a key way that Sean Parker put his stamp on the company. He had been fired twice before. He didn't want to be fired from the Facebook, and he wanted to make it impossible for Zuckerberg to get fired either. Quote, it was really beneficial to us to have Sean, it was that Sean had been a founder who had been burned, said Moskowitz. We didn't know anything about how to incorporate a company or how to take financing, but we had one of the most conservative people figuring it out for us and trying to protect us. On November 30th, the Facebook registered its million user. It had existed for just 10 months. The Facebook success was beginning to make waves, and in Silicon Valley, success attracts money. More and more investors began calling on the company, but Zuckerberg continued to be interested. I'm now just going to run through a series of milestones for the next couple of years. February 2004, the Facebook registered 2 million users. In May, the Facebook closed its first official VC funding with Excel Partners, nearly $13 million against an unheard of valuation of $98 million post-investment valuation. In September, the Facebook becomes Facebook, and they added photos for the first time, which exploded their membership, and they began to have 5 million users with ad revenue approaching a million dollars per month. 2006, Viacom offered one and a half billion to purchase it. Zuckerberg turns it down. In April, Facebook raises more money in their second 
VC round with a pre-investment valuation now of $500 million. In September, Facebook adds news feed to the site, and for the first time, there was a major negative reaction against a feature, and Zuckerberg announces new privacy controls at that time. And two weeks later, Facebook opens registration now to all parties, and 12 million people are their users. 2007, Facebook promotes itself as a platform for developers, and within six months, 250,000 developers were registered, operating 25,000 applications. Those of you who are playing Farmville, now Candy Crush can thank him for that. And now 2008, 24 million users with 150,000 new users joining each month. And within a user, uh, within uh, a year, Facebook tripled its use now to 70 million. And then I just put a chart up here to show the growth beginning from 2004 <coughs> to where it is at from last year in 2013. So you can see that once in 2008, it really just exploded at that time right now. And I know you've been following the news on Facebook. You can't help but see there's something almost weekly about the growth of the company and what's been purchasing. Just last week, that major purchase of WhatsApp to it got a phenomenal amount of 16, 15, 16 billion dollars right there. And that concludes the presentation of what Facebook's first year was like. And for me, in doing the research on it, it was just phenomenal to understand that in a dorm room, a couple of guys working on a notebook, working with open source software, built this now multi-billion dollar company that is in, I dare say, in all of our lives. Uh, it's just a, an incredible story that was told right there. And as I think as we've seen, not only with uh, Facebook, but as mentioned, Craigslist and, uh, has had a, a significant effect on old, what I'll call old media, legacy media. And for that now, I want to turn to my guest here, who is a uh, significant uh, veteran of that media and continues today teaching at this school and at Cal State Long Beach. So Gary, let's go from there. Okay. Um, Facebook has made a significant impact on the legacy media, what used to be called mainstream media, but you can't even call newspapers and television and radio mainstream media anymore. When you have uh, a website, for example, not only just Facebook, but when you have something like YouTube, where people are downloading 72 hours of videos every minute, there are more people watching things on YouTube than there are watching the major broadcasting networks, and certainly much more than watching on cable. So the mainstream media isn't the mainstream media anymore, it's YouTube. It's Netflix, it's Hulu, it's people on Facebook, and that includes journalists on Facebook. I was telling John the other day that um, I have some journalist friends who were in Russia covering the Winter Olympic Games, and they were posting furiously things on Facebook, and the whole world of the journalist has changed dramatically from when I worked at the LA Times. I worked at the LA Times from 1984 to 2008. And it used to be that you know the journalists would go and cover an event, would send their story in, and then the story would appear in the paper. And I told John of one, I, I'll never forget one time, the managing editor of the paper was a gentleman, uh, his name was George Cotliar, and George, I was designing page one of the paper, and George came over and he said, do not put this story up on the website until 4 a.m. because we want the story to appear in the newspaper first. Well, as you know, that mindset has changed dramatically, and now it's a race to get onto the website first so that you can then get credit from all the other aggregators and bloggers and TVs who will say, 
LATimes.com is reporting X, Y, and Z. That isn't the way it used to be. And I was also telling John that uh, reporters now have to post some sort of story. Their, their day is, is crazy. If somebody is covering a sporting event, for example, they are live tweeting the event, they're posting on Facebook, and once an event is over, they're sending two or three or four or five paragraphs of the story directly to the web people who are waiting to post that story immediately. Then they're posting something on Facebook, then they're tweeting some more, and then they have to write a whole different story for the newspaper because you don't want to duplicate what you've already put up on the website. People already know the results of how I use Facebook. I want to scan it there. But what I find myself doing now is going to them, just scanning their headlines, and then going to my Facebook page and see what my friends are interested in. And I'm much more, I spend much more time on Facebook looking at the feed that is going down there than I do reading extended articles. I'll find an article, I'll come back to it later. I mean, you may be finding this in your own lives, uh, what's going on for it. As, so I've certainly witnessed it in my own life, the, the uh, revolution that, that Facebook has brought about, as well as the other social media sites, but prominent among them is, is Facebook. I think we all, uh, for me, I got in many, most of these in 2008, but I haven't opened my space in years, um, and I doubt that I ever will again because it's just a very different site than what Facebook became for them. My students here at El Camino, uh, I teach a class called Mass Media and Society, and I give them three projects to do every semester. Uh, the first one they just completed is they have to keep a week-long diary of all the media that they use. A week-long diary because um, uh, Fairfield research has shown that people spend 70% of their waking hours with some sort of media. And so I had them keep a diary of all the music they listened to, if they read anything, what they did, you know, what websites they went to, and easily people were, when they wake up in the morning, check their smartphone, look at their Instagram, look at Facebook look at all their social media sites that they go to. And nowhere in there is, you know, oh, I went to the New York Times, nytimes.com, or wallstreetjournal.com, or latimes.com. Only because, and although for my class, though, they did throw in a little bit of news because I give them a quiz every week, and so they have to be <laughs> up on, on current events. But for the most part, you know, they're listening to Pandora. They're listening to Spotify. They're, this is where they're getting their music from. They're seeing what their friends are doing on Instagram. They're on Facebook. And it's, um, it's just very interesting. Everything is in the palm of your hand. And we, indeed, as you said, it's in the palm. We're walking around with it. Anytime we have what we perceive as a free moment, uh, out comes the, the phone, and we begin just scrolling, looking through it. It becomes a, uh, it, as natural as as, any, as you can imagine. Probably. I had, some students were saying that they were, they were doing their paper and looking at Facebook at the same time as they were doing their project and everything, and people are, are multitasking. Two can you know, have a television and their laptop at the same time. The, and the, the interesting thing going back, and I, I gave a lot of emphasis to it in the description of Facebook, the why Facebook is singularly different from AOL, let's say, American Online, or from MySpace, or some of the other, Yahoo, is that ownership is really, the ownership, control is really in one person's hand, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, the way this company was set up, because of his relationship with Sean Parker, drove him away from taking money too early and held off until they could take just the right kind of money as mentioned and protected him from selling off controlling interest in that company. And while the company today has issued a, a, a stock ownership, there's two levels of stock. And the owners of the stock that you and I can buy will never control that company. It's only the stock that's controlled by 
Zuckerberg and some of the other major board members that really control it. And the majority of that is by Zuckerberg himself. And so this company is really directed by the vision of this person who from the outset said, I'm interested in bringing people in, not in driving revenue. The company of the day, though, if you're following it, is pulling in an incredible amount of money from revenue, particularly people were critical of it, saying that it, 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 it was pulling it in off of the computers, but it's not succeeding with mobile, with mobile devices. But that's been turned around. The last quarter just showed what a phenomenal amount of money that Facebook is pulling in. So this, this company controlled by this individual here is, in my lights right now, well positioned to keep driving uh, its focus and how uh, we relate to it uh, very effectively as we move forward here. Um, something that you might want to add on, on, on just, I, I know I'm real strong on Facebook itself, I'm not critical of it, um, because I'm such a, I could hardly be because I'm such an uh, advocate of it, I use it every the time, I, I watch my own privacy controls on it so that I, I know what I'm putting out there. I know that's a big concern for many people. Well, that is. It, it is. And, um, and I always tell the students that you have to be very, very careful of what you put on Facebook because prospective employers are looking at your Facebook to see what you're putting on there. And they're looking at Instagram to see what you're putting on there. And if you're putting, you know, objectionable photos, you know, if you're putting sexting type things up there, there's a great likelihood that an employer is not going to hire you. So, I mean, if you're putting yourself all the way out there, then you're going to have to pay the price eventually if you're hoping to gain some real employment. You know, without a doubt, you know, we've seen a lot of things are at influence here in our changing uh, communication landscape. It isn't just Facebook but really just the mobility of communication itself. All, I dare say, all of us are walking around with a mobile device in our pocket here this evening, and we probably sleep with it nearby as well. Um, it's, it's our new best friend, and, and to some degree probably will be in the, for the foreseeable future. This is a big shift from you know, even uh, 10 years ago, um, and what's come about. Uh, and, and, and we can reach out to our friends, loved ones, old loved ones, <laughs> and send texts and send messages. It's an unbelievable, well, to a few years ago, it would seem incomprehensible that you could do this. But today, we just now take it for granted. And the problems that go along with it are, are certainly there. I know that uh, there's a lot of things that happen in the news we're reading about when uh, incidents are, uh, occur because of it. Um, we find about uh, crimes that take place by the misuse of Craigslist, an, another widely used uh, open source uh, application. Um, I'm gonna open it up, if, if that's fine with sure. you, to any questions or some of the things that some of you would like to share about it. Let me go to Betty here and then we'll come over here. Gary, have you, um, in, in the years that you've been teaching and since this evolution of Facebook, 10 years, and all social media for that matter, how have you noticed and observed the, the changes in the vernacular and the style of writing, both in your classroom as well as in journalism itself? If I can, would you mind repeating the question that we just had there for, before you answer it? Because uh, you have the mic. That's right. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, sorry. The, the question was, uh, how have I noticed a change in the vernacular and language that is used in the 10 years um, since and Facebook social media started has and social media? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you, Betty, I have really noticed it in students' papers. You know, students aren't saying, aren't spelling Y or U anymore. It's just the letter U. <laughs> and I'm, and, and yeah. And I just shake my head and, you know, LMAO and LMFAO, I'm seeing an LOL in papers and I'm saying this isn't how you write, you would never write like that for, you know, a public, a professional publication, you would never write like that. And, you know, the abbreviations and the shortening of words that have happened because of Twitter and the 130 characters, for example, 
and I'm just seeing this in papers that I get from the students. I'm obviously not from journalists, but from the students, I'm really, it's been very eye-opening. My wife is a uh, professor of kinesiology at Cal Poly Pomona, and she sees it in the papers that her students write also, and it's just, it's just amazing to see the... Um, but have you lowered your bar? Absolutely not. You could. Good. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, and my, and my students know that if there are spelling errors or errors of fact in their paper, they get a zero. Chris, you had a question right here? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, whatever happened to Severin? Severin uh, in Florida? The Severin uh, received a payout. <laughs> Um, significant. He still owns a significant portion of uh, the fa of Facebook, although his shares, obviously, as mentioned, have been diluted. And he is uh, using his investment um, in other e endeavors. And I might add, most, with the exception of Zuckerberg, um, most of the other principals who were at the company during those early years have moved on and of using their assets from that to develop other companies. His um, roommate, or uh, uh, Dustin Moskowitz, was tremendously valuable in setting up Facebook. He was really the workhorse in um, bringing, when they launched out a new school, he was the one who did so much of the, the, the coding on those, um, on the computer at that time to, to enable that to happen. Um, as they said, he wasn't a computer programmer. He was having to learn computer programming while they were creating this thing as they went along. But he was, they understood that they were doing something that was so vital, so dynamic, and they just completely dedicated. And they, as I might add, they carried a full course load during that mm -hmm. sophomore year while they were at Harvard. But each of them have gone on and are doing new things. Uh, Sean Parker as well, still involved uh, with the company as in ownership, but not on the board any longer at this time. But Zuckerberg, when you uh, you can't help but pick up the, the the business section of the LA Times and read about Zuckerberg almost every week, as there was an article in yesterday's paper I know about it as well. Sorry, Gary, can I go back to I know you indicated that you don't see it in your journalist friends, obviously, but what I think is really interesting is that um, the the level of writing could arguably be, have said to have gone down in terms of the style of writing in the average newspaper. I mean, I think I read somewhere that the average level is an eighth grade level writing. Do you think that that's a result of the social media explosion? Or do you think that's something else? I, I think that's something else, Ben. Los Angeles Times. I, I don't think that there has been um, a dumbing down of articles, for example. Uh, John and I were talking about the other day um, the great editor of the Los Angeles Times, uh, Bill Thomas, died recently. And he was the editor of the paper when I started in, uh, in, in 1984. Uh, and he had given off to, uh, to Tom Johnson also. But uh, Bill Thomas has, was the one who started um, an edition, it's a San Diego edition. Uh, San Fernando Valley edition, there was a Ventura edition. When, when I started at the paper, there were so many editions, I couldn't, I couldn't keep them all straight. I started in the Orange County edition, mm -hmm. and uh, down in Costa Mesa, and that building is still there, although it's empty. But there was an Orange County edition, there was a San Diego edition, there was a Ventura County edition, there was a Santa Barbara edition, there was a Valley edition, and, it, and there were writers everywhere. And, um, and at that time, the Times was known as a writer's paper. And from a design standpoint, it was a challenge because you would have writers like the great David Shaw, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning media critic, would write 200 inch stories. Well, number one, you would never see that today. People just don't have the attention span right. anymore exactly. to sit down. I don't care if it's on a Sunday or a Monday or Tuesday, they just don't have the attention span to sit down or the time to read a 200-inch expose of some media. But at that time, you know, there was, you know, newspaper print costs wasn't a problem for the Times. Uh, there was no worry about profit margins. The Chandler family didn't care about it. Single-digit profit margin was fine with them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but I, I, I still, to this day though, don't think that they have dumbed down their writing. I really don't. I, maybe it's something else, um, but as far as the time is concerned, and I take my classes back there every semester, uh, you know, I still think the writing quality is, uh, is, is still there. I really do, internet or not. Uh, how has how has so, have social networks and the internet changed how changed how reporters cover cover the news nowadays? Uh, great question. <laughs> reporters have to continue to feed that internet machine. It is constantly hungry. It's hungry twenty four seven, and so reporters and the people who manage the content on the websites continually have to update and refresh and change the appearance of the page every 30 minutes, every hour, because there are people around the world who are looking at websites. It isn't just people in Los Angeles who are looking at LATimes.com, for example. There are people overseas who are looking at it. There's people on the East Coast who are looking at it. And it constantly has to be refreshed and updated to keep that content fresh so people will continue to cl click on there. And so writers will um, file a very quick story after an event. They'll go and interview people and update the story to include quotes. And then they have to continue to update the story whenever new developments happen, they have to update the story again and again and again. Ever since uh, I, we started the, seeing the 24-hour cycle on news programs like CNN, I, I have this, this feeling that that demand for constantly updating doesn't get us any closer to the truth, but goes off in the other direction, where they're constantly inventing a crisis where there is none in order to get people to stay on that channel to uh, listen to the same old story, but with a new spin. Uh, is, that an, uh, is that too cynical, or? I'm, no, I, I don't. Would you repeat his question? Oh. Just, or, it's just <laughs> in a concise form. Oh, uh, I'll try. Uh, the fact that 24-hour, um, there's this 24-hour news cycle now, and the, the broadcast stations that do these, that are on 24 hours a day, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, you know, continue to bring up something and hype it more than it really should be. And I, and I think that's, that's very true. I don't think that is true at the print level, mm -hmm. but uh, sometimes it's, it's tough when uh, a, a news network continues to report on the slightest minutia that happens in something that Justin Bieber threw <coughs> eggs over the wall at his neighbor or something. I mean, really, do people really, really care about that? There does seem to be an appetite for entertainment news and for personalities and if people are doing things bad who are personalities, but um, I, think, I think for the most part newspapers really try and tamp down on that, and they leave it to the bloggers and the aggregators, and um, you know, in the TV stations to um, to do all the hype. If I could, how, uh, is there anyone here who does not have a Facebook page? I could, we have. Oh my goodness! One, there, two, three, four. <laughs> Go ahead. How much longer can I survive in this world? If I continue to decline invitations to join Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> and, and although we begin, every time I get an invitation on, on email to join somebody's Facebook, whatever, I'm wondering if I decline, does that go right back to the person who's inviting me, or is the Facebook the company simply trying to recruit me as another person? This, when I decline, does the person get the signal? Oh my God, I guess I'm I'm, I'm Don Hodder's. Uh, 
No, they don't. They don't. Yeah, you're okay. You're not. You don't. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I think Edward Snowden has shown us that everything in digital form is captured, stored, and will be examined later. It doesn't matter how infinitesimal it's being captured. Yes, the the the, 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 the NSA is examining all you right now for all the reasons that you, that you rejected it. No, I. You know, I, can you survive without Facebook? Absolutely. Oh, good. Thanks, Absolutely. <laughs> My wife is not on Facebook. I, yeah. you know, I'm very busy. As a, I'm a retired professor of history. I'm holding a hard copy of an email that's going to suck me into another very complicated project. <laughs> I'm thinking, but is this only just a small amount of stuff I could be sucked into? Or, you know, how perilous is the rest of my existence on this planet? I, I think, I think the, your existence on this planet is just fine if you choose not to deal with social media. I, I really do. I really, I don't think you have any worries at all. So I mean, I you know, oh, no. you know it, it, it's so interesting that, that, that you mentioned this and, and with social media. It is so hard to persuade my news reporting students to get away from the temptation of emailing somebody to conduct an interview. Mm -hmm. And I say to them, why would you want to email somebody to do an interview? Meet them face, whatever happened to face-to-face -to -face communication? What happened to picking up the telephone and actually talking to somebody on the phone? What are you so afraid of, of looking at somebody in the eye and talking to them on a one-to-one -one basis that you have to do everything on, you know, through a Facebook account or through a Twitter account? Find out what their phone number is, call them up, set up an appointment to go talk to them face to face. It is just, it's just amazing. That's crazy. It is, it is crazy. And I say to them, well, you know, you know, you, 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 first, you, know, you have to have questions to interview somebody with, but how do you do a follow-up on email? There's, there, the spontaneity is gone. Yeah, and it also allows them, the, the other person that's being interviewed, to shape their image in a perfect, like exactly how they want it to be. Whereas if you're in person, you have to get that, you get something deeper, something probably realer. You absolutely you, you do get something You can't create a false entity, like, which is what a lot of social media is. You have this opportunity to shape an image of yourself that you mm -hmm. think that you, you know, this person wants to do. And that's what a lot of journalists are doing yeah. to these interviews a lot. And so. we just all agree that, that Skype isn't quite there oh. yet. Everyone who ever wants to do a Skype interview, 40% of the time is spent resolving the technical problems of you're staring at a, it looks like Pac-Man. And you lose and that It's intimacy. just not there. Yeah. You lose everything. You do. You're doing the technology, intimacy, not with the actual. You lose the eye-to-eye -eye contact. You mm -hmm. get, you know, as, as a reporter, you have to be a great observer of everything. Is somebody twiddling their thumbs? Are they busily, you know, changing their glasses? Do they shift from one leg to the other leg? All the great things that you can put into a story, the mannerisms, do people use their hands? Do they smile? Do they frown? Did they give you a nasty look when you asked a question? You lose all of that spontaneity and that power of observation mm -hmm. when all you do is use the internet or the email to, to do an interview. It's as, as somebody who's worked in newspapers for 40 years, it's it's, it's just a real head shaker to see my student journalists, you know, looking to take the easy way out. And I just, and I try to make them as uncomfortable <laughs> as possible. <laughs> Get out of class right now and go find that person. Go to the music department and talk to that music professor. Go talk to somebody. Don't just sit there and email questions to them. Hey, talk to them. <laughs> Look at them. See how they act. See their mannerisms. Don't just email. Oh, it's so crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> what is it about the, the, the younger students nowadays that that's totally acceptable to them to just, you know, email and, and, and you know, Twitter and, and do all this other stuff? It's that, to us, it's obvious, totally obvious that, you know, these are important things. Well, There's you guys should respond on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, jump in, because I think that uh, you guys have a valid 
arguments against what we're saying. Uh, well, like I personally, I think that with the advancement of technology and how we, and how it's becoming more available to more people, I think we're going to see things like the new the paper newspaper isn't going to be around anymore. Like everyone will be able to look at the newspaper from their phone as technology is grown. Because I mean, if you, if you think about it, how fast are they looking back and being like, oh, I remember the iPhone 5 with a fingerprint scanner. <laughs> like, and that's, and that's another, and like with Facebook, I, I don't, I really don't, I've deleted my Facebook many times. Uh, I feel like it's, a, it's got its benefits, but it's also got its negatives. Like for all, everyone's information to be out on the web like that, and there's a, and the whole problem with the uh, what was it Project Prism Prism right right Prism and you just have there's no control over it and just with the iPhone with the fingerprint scanner Apple has every single person with that has that their fingerprints like um, when you go into the Apple store and they have the little the little test for you so you can test it out everyone every kid wants to go to test out the cool new like the new phone of course and I think. Uh, I think we are seeing kind of like what she was saying, maybe not necessarily the dumbing down of like the writing, but definitely I see more kids being so sucked into social media and so sucked into this like ego, like it's, that it's increasing the ego because now everyone's looking at you, not just your social, like what city you're living in, the whole world is looking at you. And some people like aren't ready for that necessarily. So it's definitely like consuming a lot of their life. and. Well, it's just amazing when you meet somebody like in person, growth. and they're completely different than how their images. Yeah. Is. it's because that it leaves your imagination. That's because you yeah. it leaves it open to the imagination. I think mm -hmm. it, this has this topic kind of relates to like globalization, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, I'm learning. In, uh, I'm taking in, I'm taking intercultural communications, and we're talking a lot about like globalization, and. Um, it's definitely like with the whole LA, how everyone's having this new lingo, like LOL or, or whatever right. they're saying is, since we all know it, since, since we all know it and we're usually talking to our, like our peers, people that are usually around the same age because it's on the social media devices, then that's becoming a normal thing. That is a new norm. Society is changing its norms, just like how technology just keeps changing. So. Maybe what seems, oh, you can have a conversation with a person face to face would seem like you would get more out of it, but like someone could say, oh, I could have a FaceTime call with them. I could still see their body actions. I could still get their, their tone of voice and like the nonverbal and the verbal communications. Maybe an email is, an email is a little different, but I would say for my, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I would do an email if I had a nice paper, but I, I would definitely interview the person because you would have, you, like you just can actually, it's a one-on-one, -on -one. it's straight communication versus if you're not one-on-one, -on -one, he's all the way over somewhere, you're all the way over somewhere, you're both multitasking and the brain can only like focus on one topic at a time. So you definitely do that. Yeah. But I, I would say a lot, I would say a lot of, I don't, I wouldn't say a lot of kids would know that, a lot of youth really know that, a lot of their brain is just being flooded by this mass media garbage. There's good stuff, there's good stuff, yeah, there's that's definitely true. good stuff. That is true. But there's yeah. so much stuff on there, it's so, it would take years to filter out the good stuff and like the garbage. Right. So you really don't know what, it's like, what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I you know I will I will say one thing about newspapers. You're probably right. I don't know how many more years newspapers are going to be around. I do know that there has been research uh, lately that is showing that, at least on a, you know on as far as large newspapers are concerned, you know I'm not sure how many years they'll be around, but small newspapers in small towns are thriving and are doing better than ever, and for some reason. The people who live in small towns are still picking up the newspaper. And maybe it, it might be because those small town newspapers have decided not to develop their internet resources and their internet sites to where it should be. And so people do depend on those small newspaper on those small town newspapers to cover that type of news. Maybe people go to the websites to get foreign and national news. Mm. But if you want to know what's going on in your little, small, local hometown and everything, you're still going to pick up the newspaper. 
because it's focused on that. It's and absolutely. you're invested in that business too because you probably know people who are. Well, you're getting in. professional coverage of those events, city council, and social events, and uh, schools, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. You're getting uh, good material. Yeah. From the newspaper. You are getting good material from, yeah, and you're, and you're getting from people who you know, have covered their beat, you know, one specific topic. You know, hopefully for you know some for some time, and and that's and that's a real issue with the internet and these people who are bloggers or who aggregate information, who take information from all these websites and then they make it their own and then people think that's news. You know, there's always going to be a need for content providers. There's always going to be a need for a watchdog for government. For example, like what's happening in Hawthorne and, and uh, you yeah. know, with, with the, the, the school superintendent <laughs> who's making $660,000 for three high schools and things like that. And the Daily Breeze has been right on top of that story. And I was listening to John and Ken on KFI today and they were, you know, the outrage factor is, you know, it, they were saying it's like a bell, like the city of Bell and what was happening there and, you know, the LA Times won a Pulitzer for its coverage of, of the Bell situation. And that's exactly right. You've got the newspaper might go away, but there, and I, and I tell my students, there's always going to be a need for the content providers, not just the bloggers who put their opinion out there as news. And people just have to find a way to filter out what is opinion and what is news, and you have to know that if you go to latimes.com or nytimes.com or Wash Post, those are going to be the places where you're going to get accurate news and truthful news. Um, are, by, when you say bloggers, or like people that just will write a story on something? Or people that, who have their own websites <laughs> and, uh, and write, yeah, give right. their opinion on something rather than actually going and covering an event. Because a lot of bloggers don't really go and cover a city council meeting. So pretty much anyone with a, a device where they could write on the Absolutely. Internet. You know, and, and, and as I said, a lot of bloggers will aggregate. Yeah. They'll look at a website and they'll see what was written. And they'll look at another website and see what was written. They'll formulate an opinion based on what they read, not what they observed, but what they read. And there's a big difference there, I think. Yeah. And so they take what they've read, put their opinion, and put it out there for whoever wants to read it. But if you're not there, if you're not observing and then talking to the people, then you really have to kind of uh, have an idea of how to filter what's the real information and what's the opinion. Because, I mean, every journalist, I mean, no matter how many times you say, oh, you know, in journalism, you're objective. You're not objective. Let's face it. When you go and do an interview with somebody, do you put every single <coughs> quote that the person said in the story? No, because especially for print, there's a space limitation to how much you can put in. So you are subjectively deciding what quote goes in the paper and what quote you decide to leave out of the paper. So that's a subjective thing that you're doing as a reporter. But you're trying to filter what are the most important quotes that the people need to know as opposed to every single quote that a person needs to know. So there's always subjectivity in writing news stories. Would you say writing for writing for newspapers, uh, like you would say you would pick the quotes that you think people would want to hear the most? Or, or that or it's most important for the people to hear the most? Most important for the for what the people yeah. Yeah, not, not what the people want to hear, but what is the most important.